So on the shortness of life, Seneca, um, I'm going to definitely take notes uh, on this. By the time I get done talking about it here, we're going to get through the whole essay, and you're going to, I'm going to answer all the questions on your quiz. So I'll definitely take notes on these things, aside from just the annotations that you've taken. Um, I was talking last time, I think, about, about rhetorical structure, and, and essentially it's how you construct an argument. Typically when we write an essay, we're told to, to write the intro, and in the, in, in the intro we have the thesis, and then we're told to write um, our first topics, uh, topic sentence, which is like our first argument, and our second argument, and our third argument, and then we're told to write a conclusion, and in that conclusion we sum up everything. That would be, it's, you don't have to follow this, I'm just saying this is the way we're oftentimes taught to do it. And this is, uh, this would be the structure of the essay. Uh, introduction to the conclusion, which sandwiches the reasons why we believe the things that we believe, or the information that we're conveying, whatever the purpose of the essay is. So this would be considered the structure of, of the essay. Um, it's important to think about structures because it's a great way to, for, I mean, even just in life, asking people for stuff. If you go to your boss and you ask them for, for a raise, it's good to be able to go in there and say, I want to ask for a raise, here are the reasons why, and then let me be able to summarize it for you at the end in a way that they can understand. Um, you ever ask like a, a, an eight-year-old who just watched a movie to, to explain the movie to you? What's that like? Yeah, well, so the movie, well, so, it, so there, there's, there's this, well, well, okay, well, first, there's, the, and then they're just like all over the place. You know, and then they're even acting out some of it while they're talking, and then like they walk through, they go whoa, they all go running away. That's sometimes what reading essays is like. Um, the purpose of writing an essay is just to be clear, it's to help you develop your thinking. It isn't just a mechanical thing. When in your life are you going to have to sit down and write essays? Probably not very often at all. But when in your life are you going to have to be able to think? The answer to that is pretty often, pretty often. So. I want to kind of go over uh, Seneca's structure here. He begins with this first paragraph, and he tells us um, it's a general complaint. Paulus, he tells us who he's writing it to, and he says that it's a general complaint that nature is stingy. So he opens up with this kind of like the question at issue. The question at issue. Uh, which essentially he's investigating whether or not life is, is too short. And he gives us this, um, this explanation that Aristotle complains about it, Hippocrates complains about it, and then he says that even the, the, the unthinking masses complain about this. So he's trying to give us a, a sense of the scope of how big this question is. It's something that, that vexes academics, it's something that even vexes common people. So it, it's something that concerns everybody. Um, very rarely do people complain about their lives being too long. So then second, so uh, sorry, so that's, that's this question I should Second paragraph, he continues, it's not that we have so little time, but we lose so much. So here he's giving us his thesis, and his thesis essentially is that life isn't too short. And I'm going to put an asterisk on it. So life isn't too short. Essentially he says that life is long enough to do the things that are really important. It isn't, it isn't long enough to do everything. It's long enough to do all of the things that are important. And yet the problem he goes on to point out is that we waste too much of our time. So he says that the problem here, that life isn't too short, he says the problem is that we waste too much of it. It's been like half an hour since I had a Diet Coke, you know? <laughs> <laughs> too long. Yeah, too long. Plus I need it to make a point later. So the problem is not that, that life is too short, it's that we waste too much of it. Now, what I want us to be real clear about, because I think that this will, that this will probably change how we approach what this person is saying. Nowhere in here is he finger wagging. It isn't, you waste too much time. There's none of this going on. He's talking about that, we've, that oftentimes at the end of life, we, we finally figure out what's important. Or maybe at the early on in life, we figure out what's important. And that we waste time pursuing the things that we don't see as being important. So it isn't so much that society comes along and tells you, you know, reading philosophy is what's important, and you're wasting your time by not doing it. It's, if I asked you what's important in, in life, and you would give me a list of things that would be important, I wonder if um, playing video games would be on that list of what's important. Maybe, maybe not. 
if your if your number one important thing in life is playing video games because you want to make a career out of it, then that means that whenever you're doing something useless like reading philosophy, that you're that doing that is a waste of your time because the, the playing of video games because that's what you want your career to be. That's what you should be putting your time into. And any time that you're not doing that, you're wasting your time. So there's no finger wagging going on here where he's telling you what you should do. Later on, he's going to tell you what, what he thinks you should do. But he, he's very clear about it, like saying essentially, this is what I think you should do. Not, here's what absolutely is the truth about it. It's important. It's kind of like that question where I asked you about uh, Mike Rowe. Remember one of the questions on there was, why does he begin by saying it's just my opinion? Um, the reason he begins by saying it's just my opinion is because he wants to disarm the reader. Because he's going to come along and tell you, here's what you should be doing. And if, if he comes in here and says, listen up guys, chop chop, this is what you all must do. We are going to fold our arms and go, no. We don't care what it is. If he comes in here and tells us, you should breathe, we'll be like, oh. But if he comes in and says, listen, it's just my opinion, we're more willing to listen to what the person has to say. It's softer. So um, he's being very soft here, but he's going he's gonna to get heavier just a bit. So the third paragraph, he then moves, he says, um, uh, why do we complain of nature? She has behaved generously. So he gives us examples, examples of investing versus wasting time. Or we'll say, oops, we'll say investing versus spending time. Investing versus spending time. And I think we talked about that uh, last week, if I'm not mistaken. So the difference between investing and spending time. And in short, he gives us this wonderful explanation that, um, towards the middle, um, kingly riches are dissipated in an instant if they fall into the hands of a bad manager. So you can take, if, if I came in here and gave you guys, I uh, gave everybody in here a million dollars, some of you would, would be back to zero within an hour and a half. Because you would just buy a whole bunch of stuff and you'd be, in an hour and a half would be done. Some of you, you're, you'd be a millionaire for the rest of your life, multimillionaire, and so would your, your children, and so would your children's children. Because you would take that exact same amount of money, but you would invest it far more wisely than, than some people who would just blow it all in like an hour and a half. And that's the example he's giving us here. This thing about uh, investing our time versus spending our time. He points out that um, moderate riches, um, in, in, the, in, the, sorry, um, in, in the second paragraph, kingly riches are dissipated in an instant. And then in the third paragraph, he gives us a bunch of examples, essentially, of this. Pointing out that you know, some people do this, some people are worn out because they end up working so hard, some people are just lackadaisical. So he gives us kind of like this, this, um, this balance between the two. Um, giving, and the whole idea is that somewhere in that list, you should probably be able to find yourself. He says, some, some follow no plan consistently, and then others, of course, are fickle. So they're, they're, so they're fickle, and some people follow their, their plans so rigidly that they can never move off of it. Those are both extremes. You probably don't want to be either of those two things. He continues in paragraph four, we surround and tempt ourselves with vices, and this is a really important thing. Um, yesterday I asked a class, um, somehow the subject came up about greed, and I asked him, like, you know, so who's greedy? And he just says, corporations. I go, right, corporations are, are, are greedy. He goes, yes. And I go, right, guys? And the whole class is just like nodding their heads like, yeah, corporations are, are very greedy. And I ask him, why do you guys hate corporations so much? And they said to me, because they're greedy. And so, it's so not thinking. You know, like we, you guys like eating? Yeah. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah, yeah, thank the corporation for that. You guys like your clothes? Thank the corporation for that. This whole building right here, this was built by a construction corporation. Corporations themselves are not evil. People who run things are evil all the time. And so I said, I asked him, um, but I said, well, yeah, so corporations are greedy. So we should definitely have people from the government come in and fix that. And he goes, right. I see a problem with this. <laughs> Why are corporations greedy? Because people run them. Who runs the government? People. The problem is not with the makeup of a government. The problem is not the makeup of the corporation. The problem is that people run these things. And so it isn't so much that, that, that corporations themselves are greedy, it's because people are greedy. And it seems like a strange thing. If, if you think that people behave differently when they're in charge of government than when they're in charge of a corporation, no, they behave just as evilly on both sides. And it's not to say that every government institution is evil. It's not to say that every corporation is evil. It's just to say that the problem is with people who run these things. 
And so it's weird that we'll put so much faith in one institution and none in the other. And when I ask you, like, what does government provide versus what does Starbucks provide? Many of us will understand far more about what Starbucks provides. But he points out, we surround and tempt ourselves with vices. So the problem is not, like, why is that we waste our time? A lot of times we'll say, like, oh, it's just there's too many distractions in society. The problem is not society. The problem is you. What do you surround yourself with? Um, he point, you know, so he says that the problem is that we surround ourselves with distractions. We choose to. We surround ourselves with distractions. <clears throat> any of you guys, um, any of you guys um, go to study, and then you put your phone on the desk next to you when you go to study? Or you want to read something and you put your phone right next to you when you go to read or you keep your phone in your pocket or nearby? Yeah, and how far into all that stuff do we get before we get distracted by the phone? Um, yeah, sometimes you have to put those things away. I have a friend who studies, she's in the school right now. Um, if I text her, I won't hear back from her for hours. And when she texts me back, she'll say, sorry, I'm studying. And I know what that means. She actually puts her phone in a, in a, in a table, I'm sorry, in a desk drawer in a different room when she studies because she knows herself. She knows that if that phone goes off, she's going to check it, and then she's going to have to restudy everything that she was just looking at for the past however long. She just knows herself. And now if we ask ourselves, what is it that, that distracts us? Well, we surround ourselves with these kinds of things. So let's say the important thing to you is, I don't know, fill in the blank of whatever it is, but then we surround ourselves with things that distract us from doing that thing. If you're studying for school, but you surround yourself with, with your phone or, or with a radio or with anything else, then you have to understand that it's, this is part of the problem. We, now, thinking about how it is that we waste our lives and waste our times is because we allow ourselves access to those things that waste our lives and waste our times. Whatever it is. Um, I wonder if any of you guys are like a really hardcore into, into fitness. And if you are, you have a bunch of, of, of um, like junk food laying around. In fact, when people start diets, you ever hear this before? How do, you start, how do you have to start your diet? Well, I have to eat all the junk food in my house first. That way it's gone. <laughs> Why do you eat it? Why don't you just throw it away? Well, because I don't like wasting food. Oh, really? It's about the waste? No, it's because it tastes good. You know, and you're like, well, this is my last effort, and then you eat all this stuff. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten to the end of an ice cream tub <laughs> and said, no more. No more. You know, and every time, it's, it, it, there's more. Um, I recently discovered frozen yogurt. I never knew about this, this gem uh, that, that, for which the gods had provided us. There's a place over next to um, Price Breakers Tutti Free, and uh, I've never been there before. My friend mentioned getting ice cream and uh, getting um, frozen yogurt, so I went there, and I'm like, so you put it into your own cup? Yes. And you put whatever you want on top of that. She says, yes, but you have to pay by the weight. I said, well, we all pay by the weight. But money is no object when it comes to frozen yogurt. This all looks so yummy. So I got this, so the first time I bought one, I'm not exaggerating, it was like $27 for one. So you can imagine how heavy this thing was. Oh. Yeah, and so um, I, I thought, well, you don't need to get that much next time, Scanlon. You've already proven you can't, but you don't need to anymore. And so now, I, uh, I, I went there yesterday, I, I got one, and it was, yeah, it, was, it wasn't too far off that. It was still like, I think I paid like $30 for two of them. And so I'm, even though it's like, well, that's half the price, yeah, but it's still a lot, you know, and I keep thinking to myself, next, okay, next time, I'm only going to, well, no, why? Because the distractions are right in front of me. It's, you know, you walk up and you're like, I'm just going to get the frozen, are those peanut butter cup pieces? <laughs> oh, the boba, oh, uh, five different colors, well, that must mean five different versions of yummy goodness. <laughs> and so, and then last, and I got home last night, and I was with, my, I was with a friend of mine, and, and the, uh, the power went out. So I was sitting there watching, you know, Game of Thrones, and then I kind of want the power went out. So I set up my phone as a hotspot, and now I can't. What, what am I gonna do? I can't put it back in the fridge, right? Because it's gonna melt because the power is out. So what do I have to do with the frozen yogurt? You have to eat it. All of it. Because <laughs> otherwise it's gonna go bad. <laughs> Instead, I'm sitting on the couch, you know, <sighs> never again. <laughs> and then what am I thinking about right now as I tell this story? Tonight, yeah, after the gym, I'm gonna go get some frozen yogurt. <laughs> because we surround ourselves with the things that are destructive to us. It isn't just the distractions, but it's also the things that are destructive to us. Because the things that are destructive to us are so goddamn much fun. Listen, seriously, 
you can message with that. Maybe you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, but really, you can message with that one person because it's just messaging, right? Nothing's going to come from that. It's just, oh my God, you don't understand, Sam. Things are so different today than they were than, than they were back then. Uh huh. <laughs> tell me, tell me from your hill how different things are today than they were back then. It's that arrogant belief that things are different today that causes us to behave in ways that we think we're not susceptible to. You know, the human spirit, man, we've been around for 300,000 years as in, in our current form. You think that much has changed because all of a sudden we have Instagram? You think that that changes the human condition? That that changes all of human psychology? No, it just gives us an opportunity to express the worst forms of it. So, we allow ourselves to be distracted by these things. We introduce these things that are destructive into our lives. And we say the whole time, not me, but, you know, of course, us. So paragraph five, not even the combined genius of the wisest people can explain this. And he's got this great explanation here where he says that essentially people, we, we, will, we will give away our, our time, but not our money. We give away time, but not our money. So we give money, so we give time away, but we guard our money. Uh, if anybody in here has a job, I was asking someone last period if anybody had a job. This one girl said she did. And I asked her, uh, "Do you mind if I ask you how much you earn an hour?" She said, "15 an hour." It's okay. So if someone comes and talks to you, and and talks to you, and talks to you, <laughs> and talks to you, and an hour and a half goes by. We'll just say an hour goes by. Understand that that means that you just trade your one hour for nothing. And you might sit there and go like, "Well, I wasn't doing anything else anyway." That's part of the problem. That's an hour that you could have been putting into the thing that you think is important. But now, if I came along and said, oh, whose money is that? Like, oh, that's mine. I go, how much is it? And they go, 15 bucks. I go, oh, cool. I walk away. You'd be incredibly pissed off about that. You'd jump on my back and try to choke me out. You wouldn't be successful, but you would try. But so we would guard our money in a way that we do not guard our time. We give away our time but we guard our money. He says that's essential, but this is the thing that's irreplaceable, and that also your time represents your money. I'll take $15 from a person, they flip out, but I'll take an hour from a person, they won't think anything of it. It's the same thing, it's your time, it's your life. And you know, so he points this out, um, and he says that nobody on earth is willing to give away their money, but everybody gives away their time. And again, it's that time thing that's so important because that's what we're, we're lacking when we say life is too short. So paragraph six, he continues. And in explaining that, I should, uh, I should like to buttonhole one of the, older, one of the oldsters. Uh, to buttonhole is to, is to force somebody into a conversation. So he wants to force an old person into a conversation. And this is a paragraph that, I remember when I read this the first time, I was like, there I was, like 18 or 19. It, I don't know, man, it, it, I, it got my mind working in a, in a, in a strange way. He goes on to explain that, um, uh, all right, I'll just read it. I see that you've reached the highest life expectancy. So you've reached the end of your life. You're now close to a century or almost a hundred years old. Please give us an itemized account of your years. Calculate how much of that life was subtracted by a creditor, a mistress, a patron, a client, quarreling with your wife, punishing your slaves, gadding about the, the, so, the city on social duties. It'd be great if, when you die, you're on your deathbed, um, death comes in physically. And actually better yet, death's accountant can walk in the door and go, hi, nice to meet you, you're about to die, you've got five minutes left, so I wanted to go over this accounting of your life with you. And actually have like a full adding up of all of the hours you spent doing everything. Uh, any of you guys play video games on Steam? Yeah. yeah. It, that does that, yeah? So it it tells you how many hours you log on the game, yeah. and you sit there and you're like, Oh, come on. Man. Yeah, I'm going to take a picture of, of my one for, for Civilization VI. Because in, in my defense, I, still, I, don't, I never sit there and just play. Oh, I, I'm always... That would be terrible, didn't you? <laughs> Who plays games like that? <laughs> um, I never just sit and play. Um, I'll, I'm watching a, a lecture on YouTube or I'm listening to something important. I never can just sit there. But that's why I like the game. Because I can do this kind of mechanically while I'm listening to someone talk about something. But um, I'm gonna, I won't even guess. I'm going to take a picture and bring it to you and show you how many hours it, it, it is on. It, it's unreal. It's in the thousands. Because I've been playing it for so long. Now, would it be great if this guy sat there and said, uh, whatever, 2,000 hours of Civilization VI. And I'm on my deathbed. I'm like, but I wasn't playing the whole time. Sometimes I would like leave, for a couple, leave home for a couple of hours and leave it running while I leave. 
And you just go, no, no, this, this is the time you actually spent playing, not the time it was running. Oh, okay, what else do you have? And I look at this and go, uh, oh, trolling. Okay, trolling, you know what the trolling is, yes, okay. So here's your hours of trolling. Oh my god. Do you have a number of people I pissed off with it? Oh yeah, we got that here too. In other words, if death could come to you, you'd get a full accounting of everything that you did in your life. And you could look at it and go, oh my god, I spent how much time on this one thing or that thing? So he says he'd like to grab an old person and ask them to do that. Give a full accounting of their life. And it's interesting, if I were to ask you, um, um, oh, good example, last week a, a, a student uh, got up and left in the middle of class, so what, uh, and didn't say anything, didn't grab a pass, whatever, so I just marked her absent. And then she, she ends up coming back and she says, you marked me absent today. I said, I did. And she's like, why? I said, because you left for 30 minutes. Yeah, I wasn't gone for 30 minutes. She was gone for 30 minutes. I happened to know this because I sent a text message to somebody when she was leaving. And then when she came back in, I was sending another one to somebody else. So I could look at the time where I sent that first message and then the next one. I said, you're gone for 32 minutes. And she's like, no, I wasn't. She, and by the way, was she lying to me? No. I, I'm sure she was dead serious. She did not realize she was gone for 32 minutes, uh, for 30 minutes. She just didn't realize it for 32 minutes. Why? Because when we're doing something like that, we don't really think about how long we're doing it for. So I wonder how long, if we were to do that, to give a full accounting of our time, we would sit there and go, Oh, dude, there's no way I spent that much time on such and such. And Death could go, yeah, bro, we, got it. we have a, a video recording if you want to watch it for all eternity. But yeah, you've been doing that. So he said that we'd like, it'd be interesting, thought experiment, to give an accounting of, of, every, of all of our hours and what that would tell us. Now, I would suggest to you, Seneca doesn't say this, but I would suggest to you that you could do this. You could do it daily. Um, if you ever have to hire an attorney, Attorneys charge you what's called billable hours. A billable hour means that they're billing you for an hour of work. That's what exactly what it sounds like. And what they do is they sit there and they, um, they look at the clock and they go, 1214. All right, so if I had to defend Sebastian, how would I do it? I start going through my head about how it is that I would defend my client. And then when I finally go, okay, yeah, I think that that might work. And then they write down 1238. So I just spent uh, 24 minutes, uh, I'm sorry, 14 minutes, no, 20, 24 minutes figuring out how to defend this person. And then they add that to, to, to your bill. So they itemize it, you know, August, for, uh, August 31st, whatever it was, between 1214 and 1238, I was, so they give you an itemized of, of all this stuff. And it add, that's what makes a lawsuit so incredibly expensive, because all those billable hours add up. And if you've got like a, a law firm, and you've got like six people working on the case, like a big corporation, six people are all doing that. So it's possible. So I would suggest to you maybe something that's worth thinking about one day. Just do it for one day or doing it for one afternoon. Just keep a log of what, of what you do and how much time you spend on it. And then you can extrapolate from there. Um, it's either going to be a great experiment for you or it's going to depress the hell out of you. Uh, paragraph 7. Uh, why should it be this way? It is because you live as if you would live forever. The thought of human frailty never enters our heads. So he gives us a motivation for why it is that we live this way. And in short, it's, you know, I'm going to say ignorance, but what I mean by that is not as an insult. Ignorance has to ignorance. What I mean by that is that we don't think of it this way. We don't realize that, uh, that we're going to die, and we don't stay focused on that thing. So we live this way because we're ignorant. We think that life is forever, or at least we treat it this way. We treat it this way. And it isn't until you get near the end of your life that you get a strong taste of death that now you start to realize, uh-oh, I should start doing the things that are important. But now you realize you don't have the energy that you used to have. You don't have the motivation that you used to have, and so forth. Uh, paragraph 8. Among the worst offenders, I count those who give all their time to drink and lust. So, of the worst offenders, he says, I count um, those who... Be, I'll be delicate. Those who drink and have, uh, those who are constantly drinking and having sex. Now he goes on to say that is the sorriest use, that is the sorriest abuse of all time, for the phantom of glory which possesses men. So now when he's talking about that, about, uh, about using up your time that way or focusing so much your time on that, he essentially is talking about glory. And so he, he's kind of arguing that like the reason that a person would go out and have a you know you know you know hundred sexual partners is because they want to feel like I did this, like I accomplished something. People wanted me. And so people feel like, wow, I, I, 
That must mean I'm, I'm worth having. It gives a person a sense of, of worth, a sense of glory. Uh, same with like drinking. People will drink because they want to forget what they're going through in their lives or because they want to be cool. So it's not just, you know, that he's saying that these are bad things. He's saying it's this pursuit of glory through these things that makes it a, a terrible thing. And yet, if I asked you what it is in your life that you want to accomplish, I wonder if glory is the thing that you say that you want. And if it's not, then the time that you're spending seeking this, which glory, think of it as just like the approval of others, the adoration of others. When you know, other people adore you, then that means that you're not pursuing the thing that's important to you. You're pursuing the thing that's important to other people. So, for example, um, let's say that money really is not that important to you, but you're pursuing it because you want people to look at you and think good things about you. That's be the only reason they'll think good things about you is because money is important to them. So you're going to pursue money, which isn't important to you, because you want the praise of people, because money is important to them. So you end up pursuing the things that other people want, not what you want. And then, of course, that's a waste of time, because then you get near the end of your life and you say, oh my goodness, this wasn't the thing I wanted. You know, sure, I may have lots of money, and that might sound good to you if you're somebody who wants it. But now think about what you traded that money for. Life experiences, time with family, time with friends, whatever it is. Because life is a zero-sum game. You don't get to make more time, you can only put more into it. So this is why he, he's, he complains about these folks. And it isn't just saying like, ugh, I hate these activities. He, he's saying that it's, it's bad to pursue the things that are important to others. Uh, and by the way, when he uses this word glory, keep in mind he's, he's, he's a Roman. And he's writing in Roman times. So he's not really too concerned about, about being popular. So when he says this, he means that. Right, paragraph 9. The only people, you know, this is probably where he says his smartest thing. The only people really at leisure are those who take time for philosophy. So who are the only ones not wasting their time? This game. Philosophy. Let me explain. Philosophy is uh, two words together. Philo, which means love. And Sophia, which I spoke the person's name, not the not the word Sophia, which means wisdom. So philosophy means love of wisdom. It comes from a statement from Socrates. Socrates said that you can't really know anything, but people who seek, oh, so yeah, you can't know any, you can't know absolute truth but you can pursue it, you can try to get closer to it. And he referred to people who pursue truth, even though they'll never get there, as philosophers, people who love wisdom. So a philosopher is someone who loves wisdom. So he says here, the only people at leisure who, who, uh, who take time for, for philosophy, people who seek wisdom and they seek truth. Now, again, he's not talking about a person who goes out, studies proper philosophy, gets a degree, goes and becomes a professor. He's saying that, uh, that the best way to spend your life is to seek truth seek truth. And that shouldn't be anything that surprises most of us, because there's nothing that's more powerful in the universe than truth. I mean, to, to, to pursue truth is to pursue reality itself. And there's nothing that's more powerful than reality. Every lie falls, uh, falls away when it's compared to reality. We might think that's not true. People believe false stuff all the time. It takes time, but we end up finding the truth. In other words, all those things eventually do dissipate, and the only thing that remains at the end of everything is truth. In fact, truth is the, th is the very thing that, that sets us free. And so this is why when he said the only people who are really at leisure, the only people who are really doing this are the people who are seeking truth. They're seeking wisdom. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to sit there again and contemplate only the deepest ideas. But it means that whatever it is that you're pursuing, let it be something that you're pursuing the truth about. Don't let it be something that's, that's inauthentic. They, if you're referring to people who love wisdom, he says, they alone really live. So only those people who see truth are the ones who really do fully live. It's not their lifetime alone, and this is why it's important, it's not their lifetime alone of which they're careful stewards. They annex every age to their own. Um, to annex is to take control of. So he's saying it's not just their own lives that they live. Where is truth to be found? Everywhere. <laughs> um, have, we, this is part of the problem when we say things like, you know, um, uh, Scott, come on, you know, it's, it's 2022, you know, things are different today. Yeah, yeah, kind of. The human condition isn't changed. It isn't that things are more or less true in 2022. 
I hear when the students will tell me that, they'll say, oh, come on, it's 2022. That's good. Now I can let the historians know exactly when civilization began to collapse. <laughs> Thanks for identifying the year for me. But, the, uh, but we, we have this tendency to think that whatever's happening today is where truth is to be found. Because that's the way things are now. You know, things change. Things change. Truth doesn't change. Things change. Truth doesn't change. If you found truth in 2022, that's wonderful. And that should correspond to the same truth that you found in 1494 or whatever. And that should be the same kind of a truth that you found in the year 614 or whatever. In other words, if it's true, it's consistent throughout the ages. It isn't true just for a time. And that means that you have to, as a philosopher, you have to be somebody who's open-minded and willing to pull truth from wherever it is, as uncomfortable as it is, or as comfortable as it is. Um, I know some people who get so caught up in themselves, being academic and being intellectual, and you'll ask them what they've listened to, and they're listening to Mozart. And they're like, wait, wait, wait. And they'll listen to it. Oh, it's divine. I'm sorry, what were you saying? And I'll, and I'll say, oh, I, I went to go see Cardi B last night. That's what I was saying. It's like, oh, you listen to that? And I'm always like, oh, you don't. Don't you know that it's 2022? Is, is Mozart great? Like, yeah, yeah, listen to him. Is, is, is Cardi B great? No. I don't know. Do you think so? You tell me. Yeah, it's interesting. How many of you guys listen to Mozart and go, and you guys listen to Cardi B and go, wait, wait. Oh, there it was. Divine. <laughs> you know, but, but you do sit there and you, and you tap your toe. In other words, it's something that still gets inside of you and you're like, huh. And not to be a jerk, but I mean, Cardi B has sold more records than Mozart, hasn't she? And so that doesn't mean that just because something sells a lot, it's great. But what it does mean is that just because something sells a lot doesn't mean it's not great. And just because something comes out in 2022 and uses a, a, different, a, a different language or a different slang than you use, that doesn't mean it's trash. It just means it's different. And if you shut yourself off to that and say, nothing good has been produced since the 15th century, well, then you're losing 600 years of, of, of great stuff that you could be getting out of life. And by the way, if truth has been discovered since then, you're missing out on truth also. The problem is that we shut ourselves off and we just figure... You know, nothing that, nothing that came before this one time period is, is of any value. Young people just don't know anything. Do you guys know stuff? Yeah, you guys know stuff about the world that you're living in right now. And if you don't, and if, and if I don't, if, if people don't listen to what you're saying, by the way, just because what you're saying, you know the thing that they say, well, young people, you are the future. And we all go, yeah, we're the future. You're the future. You're not the present. Understand that. You're not the present. In order to be, you will be the present someday, but you're not, because you don't have the wisdom, you don't have the life experience, you don't have the. You might say, but I, I'm talking. Look around you. I'm talking about the people all around us. Can we, can, any, can we all acknowledge that? I hope that if you're sitting in your in your math class that you look at the person next to you who's I don't know trying to put paper clips up their nose to see how many they can put. Do you really want to look at that person and go? That person should be president today. <laughs> you know. You will be, but just like the present generation, and it doesn't mean that the present generation is doing things well, and that doesn't mean you're going to either. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I hope I'm around for it. I really want to see what the hell you guys come up with. I want to be that. I want to be in the supermarket and go, what? They're doing what? <laughs> so just because something is, is from a different age doesn't mean it's wrong. And just because it's from a different age doesn't mean it's right. A philosopher is someone who can sit there and say, yeah, what came out here is, is correct. Philosopher, someone can sit there and go, yeah, what happened here was correct, no matter where it is, and be able to, to put it together. And that's a person who seeks, who seeks real truth. Finally, in the tenth paragraph, in the meanwhile, while people are robbing and being robbed, while they disrupt each other's repose, their calmness, and make one another miserable, life remains without profit, without pleasure, without moral improvement. No one keeps death in view. So as we're wasting time, he says that these are the consequences of wasting time. We're robbing and being robbed. By that he means we're robbing each other of our time. While we and we disrupt each other's calmness. Because we have so much time, we, we, we go online, we troll, and we shitpost. Just to piss people off. You know, we're making other people miserable. And yet, while we're doing all that, and while we're wasting time, life remains without meaning, without purpose, without profit. And if it doesn't have those things, it doesn't have pleasure. And you might, you know, that doesn't mean like you can't have fun right now. You might be laughing like, ha ha, I made this person really mad. 
But I don't know, man, maybe you're going to wake up one day and realize, I shouldn't have given my drama teacher a, a, an acid flashback, you know, a Vietnam flashback. Maybe that was a bad thing to do. You know, it's as funny as it is. Um, and he says here, without moral improvement, to improve yourself, to become better, to improve yourself, that you can't improve yourself if you're wasting time. And you're going to improve yourself in kind of inverse correlation. The less time that you waste, the more you're probably going to improve yourself in certain ways. So there's his structure. I didn't write down paragraph 10, but number six five. So we've got his question and issue, then his, his thesis, and then his, um, and he gives us examples to defend his thesis. And then he gives us he, he answers a counterargument, you know, is that we we, we surround ourselves with distractions. Not that the world's distracting, we we choose to do this. We choose to give away our time also, to provide our money. We uh, and then afterwards if we were to give an accounting of that, we would realize the error of our ways. And so, and, and, the, and, um, and then the reason that we do it, and then, so then the explanation for why we do it, is because we just don't realize that we're not going to live forever. And so maybe if we, learned, if, we, if we got that to our heads, then we would do it, because the alternative is to live for other people, not for yourself, which of course is no, you know, is not, at the end of all that, um, we're going to realize that if we pursue truth, that this was a waste, pursuing other people's um, other people's respect. I don't want to say that. That's what I'm thinking of. Um, other people's. Uh, I couldn't remember this word last week either. Seek other people's adoration. Oh, uh, approval. <laughs> <laughs> to seek other people's approval. We're going to realize if we, if, we, if we see truth that we're actually seeking other people's approval and not our own. So we should seek wisdom instead and find truth because that truth is going to lead you to what you should be doing in life. And then ultimately, he says, you know, and if you don't do that, the, the consequence of not doing that, paragraph 10, is that you're going to make yourself and everybody around you miserable. So, and there's a structure. Questions? Comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques?